That's a big statement. Let's elaborate on that. Some of the stories that these perpetrators come from are pretty, pretty tough. And again, never to minimize what they're doing, but to go, I also have capacity to cause great harm with people in my life. It might look differently, but my capacity to cause harm is about a step or two away. And we all have that if we're really honest before each other and before God. Welcome to the Light in the Darkness podcast, where we speak life and shine light on the issue of human trafficking. Human trafficking is a multi-billion dollar criminal industry, and there are approximately 49.6 million people enslaved around the world today. For the last 20 years, Zoe International has joined in the fight to end human trafficking by focusing on the areas of prevention, rescue, and restoration. Our mission is to reach every person with the gospel and rescue every child from human trafficking. My name is Hillary and I'm a Zoe staff member here. And today we are going to be speaking about the role that the church can play in fighting to end human trafficking. I am here with the one and only Pastor Dan Broyles. Great, thanks for having me. And I'm just thankful for Zoe. Zoe, you guys are on the front lines of making a difference. And I talk about you guys everywhere, so. Oh, I, I love appreciate it. that. We're so thankful for you and we're thankful for the partnership that we could have over the years. and. For those of you who are just now listening and maybe aren't familiar with Pastor Dan, we'd love to hear a bit more, Pastor Dan, about your pastoral background and, you know, if you could tell us how you got involved in the fight against human trafficking. Sure. So I started out as a social worker with LA County Department of Children's Services, and just that grew in me, the desire to protect kids. And then from there, I ended up switching to become a pastor. And then I was part of a, a local task force in Santa Clarita, and Zoe was instrumental in some things. And we invited Zoe to this other task force. Mm. And Zoe did a great job. They presented. And at the end of our meeting, myself and another colleague said, wow, we really need to do something to, to address trafficking in our own area and not just be like silent about it. So... However, there was a few other people that are part of the, that task force that said, well, this doesn't fit our exact mission. So I don't think we are, we're going to do anything about it. Mm. So a friend and I then decided, well, we're going to kind of go rogue and start our own thing and do something because we can't be silent and we can't be passive about the issue. So that was about 2015. And from there, we literally just put people together in the community from our local junior college, from law enforcement, nonprofit work, faith work. I said, let's get together and talk about what can we do to make a difference and not let that, and be in a voice really for those who are vulnerable and who are trafficked and not be passive about it. And how do we work together? And so a group formed and we've been meeting once a month for now for eight years and putting on conferences and doing trainings for Henry Mayo Hospital to churches, to therapists, to public school districts and been doing all sorts of great work over the years. I love that. I love that you took that initiative and you didn't let some of the barriers you found stop you from moving forward. What kind of motivated you to transition into being a pastor and then take that extra step to do what you're doing now? So why transition from a social worker to a pastor is the church I was at uh, at the time said, do you want to basically help be part of starting a spiritual care or a counseling ministry mm -hmm. and get it off the ground. And so I have a background of pastor. I'm also a licensed therapist. And I said, I'd love to help my home church mm -hmm. and help get stuff off the ground because there's so much pain in people's lives. And I would say one of the best ways to be the hands and feet of Jesus is to address them at their greatest pain. Mm -hmm. So their pain matters to God. So it, also needs to matter to us. Yeah. So I want my heart to be closer to God's heart. So if it matters to God, it should matter to me. And so I would say I've been given the feedback that I'm a, well, at this point, a pastoral social worker. Interesting. That's like the feedback I've gotten. Um, so I love stepping into probably the places that at times people avoid. So I'm like, oh, let's step into that suicide assessment. Let's step into helping people with past trauma. Let's step into um, people's secrets and be the hands and feet of Jesus. So probably one of the mo most influential parts of my story was actually when I was a teenager, when I was at Saugus High School, I, I took a peer counseling class. Mm. And looking back, I was probably, 
I think we were like guinea pigs for the teacher, what they were learning in grad school. And I didn't know that at the time. And I remember at in this class, almost a third of the students talked about their story of sexual abuse. Wow. It was a class of 25 students and about a third of them, like this was their story. Wow. And I grew up a pastor's kid and I was thinking at that time, and this was in the 90s when things weren't talked about as much. What is the church doing to address this type of pain? Because we have these cliches like, Jesus is the answer. And what's God's love going to do for you? And I'm like, well, how do we have God's love affect that type of story? Right. And I remember as a, literally as a 16-year-old guy having those thoughts, going home, going, we have to address those things. If we don't address that, we're just doing superficial work. Absolutely. And we're not called to superficial work. No. We're called to the trenches. Yeah. And the Bible is really clear about um, people's heart. And when the Bible talks about people's heart, it's their whole internal being, mm. their motive, their will, their emotions, their story. So when it says, love the Lord God with all your heart, it's changed the whole internal structure of their inside being. I love that. And I love how you brought up of meeting them at their deepest pain. Mm-hmm. And how in that class, it sounds like that was almost your first introduction to realizing just how many people around you have such deep pain, Mm -hmm. you know? And I do feel like we have to be really intentional as a church to meet people in that space. Mm -hmm. From your experience and just things you've done over the years, what does that look like practically for the church to meet people in their pain? Well, one of the things I would say is a willingness to enter into the pain without making it all better. Like, I want to sit in the pain with them. Um, typically, I think in, I've seen in friendship settings, church settings, we either do one of two things. We either avoid it because it causes us anxiety or we try to fix it right away. Yeah. And it's really about our own anxiety instead of, I think like Job's friends, they were great the first seven days mm-hmm. in Job 3. They sat in the pain with them and when they tried to fix it, they made it worse. Mm-hmm. So... To go, I'm going to sit in someone's pain, and I don't want them to feel alone in their pain. Trauma needs a gentle witness that your pain matters. Yeah. And I would say some people, the pain of abuse or assault isn't the worst pain. It's the pain of I was alone in the trauma and in trying to recover. That was just as bad as the actual event. Yeah. And so I probably use the phrase all the time like in a pastoral counseling setting, your pain really matters. And if you want to go deeper, I want to listen and validate it. And if you don't, that's okay too. And giving freedom in the healing process. Yeah. I like that you brought up Job. For those who maybe aren't familiar with the story, what about Job do you think relates to what we're talking about when it comes to human trafficking and trauma and how God plays a role in being there with us in that? Yeah, I would say Job's friends thought they knew the why the suffering was happened. They made a lot of what I would say religious assumptions as to why there was evil going on around Job and in Job's life, and they were off. Mm. Their assumptions were wrong, and thus they came across as really judgmental people. And the the end of the story is really interesting because God pretty much says to Job, I'm only going to forgive them if you forgive them Mm. because they were wrong in how they represented me because of how judgmental they were and the assumptions they made. And so some people, when trauma goes on or abuse goes on or bad things happen, they're like, oh, this is happening because God is judging me or something I did when I was younger or all those things, there's all these assumptions. And I, I'm, it's okay to ask why questions, but sometimes we don't always know the whys to things, but I would like to spend more time giving purpose to the pain than figuring out the why to the pain. That's really powerful, purpose to the pain rather than the why. Because the why doesn't change how the pain affects us. The why doesn't even really help us to know what to do with the pain. And I think some people almost think if I figure out the why, then I won't hurt as bad. I don't think that's true. Mm. I've sat with people and I'm like, you might figure out the why, but you're still grieving or you're still physiologically really hurting because of the trauma or you're still having triggers or flashbacks. The why doesn't take away the depth of hurt. 
Right. So instead of the why, it seems more like the what. What are we going to do yeah. about the pain? Mm-hmm. And it brings us back to what we're talking about is the role of the church in mm-hmm. fighting to end human trafficking. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can recognize that there's pain. We could recognize mm-hmm. that there are people being bought and sold mm-hmm. all over the world. Mm-hmm. What do we do about it now? Yeah. You know, and that's the thing we really have to unpack. Yeah. There's some real practical thing churches can do, but I would say more philosophical or even like biblical, I would say it starts with having God's heart for the vulnerable. I don't think that part of like our faith is optional. Mm. Like I wouldn't say prayer is optional or try to be generous. I'd say having God's heart, I think in the Old Testament, there's a word, a Hebrew word called mishpat. Mm that is translated 200 times for justice in the Old Testament. And mishpat doesn't mean just giving people like their due right, it's giving them their due protection. Mm. And so in the Bible, there's three types of vulnerable people that's repeated over and over again that you support, and it's the foreigner, the widow, and the fatherless. Yeah. And I've always said, I want my heart to be more like God's heart. And from that, let's see, let's see what happens from there. And so I think in a lot of churches in the United States, it's like out of sight, out of mind. And if it doesn't affect my daily kids going to school, my job, my hobby, my church, like directly, if I don't see a direct impact right now, it's easy to d- dismiss. Yeah. And my heartbeat is God doesn't dismiss this at all. So I can't dismiss it. That's so true. It's it's taking ownership in a way. I'm saying, even though this doesn't directly yes. impact me, I'm going to make a direct impact mm-hmm. in this area because I believe this is what God is calling yeah. us to do as Christians. And especially as Christians, I think we minimize um, our salvation experience, meaning everybody who's a Christian has an adoption story. That's so true. And I don't, like, if you talk to the average Christian, I'd say, hey, tell me about your adoption story. I think we frame it that way. But the Bible's really clear about that. And Christians don't go from, like, neutral, according to the Bible, to adopted. They go from slave to sin to adopted. Right. And so I think if we understood our own, like, spiritual story that way, to go, wow, I was taken out of slavery, sin-wise, and brought into adoption why would I, you know, spiritually that's what happened with me. Why would I want not to do that physically with somebody? Right. Like, but I don't think that's on a lot of Christians' minds mm-hmm. um, when they think of their own spiritual kind of journey. Yeah. It, I could even make the case that maybe it's something that Christians don't feel equipped to know mm-hmm. what to do. Yeah. Right. Especially if we struggle to deal with our own trauma. Mm-hmm. And that's something that isn't addressed as often in the church. Or... Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about so many things, but yeah. how often that we're talking about personal trauma, yeah. how you heal. And Absolutely. Even if somebody has great intentions, and I'm sure there are several people listening yeah. who their hearts break for the issue of human trafficking. Absolutely. But not many of us are equipped with the knowledge, the understanding, yeah. to even know what human trafficking is, let alone mm-hmm. what to do about it. You know, mm-hmm. so from your experience and the knowledge you have, what are some basic things you think? can be shared today that can equip listeners who maybe are in that boat, Mm -hmm. who they want to help, but they just aren't sure exactly what that looks like in a practical sense. I would say to start somewhere. I think there's this mindset sometimes that I have to be a professional to help in this arena. Mm. I have to be a social worker, I have to be a pastor, I have to be a missionary. I have to have almost like a title to help, which I don't think that's in the Bible at all. So just uh, taking what I would say the next small step to go, how can I have God's heart and what can I do to be informed? What, can I find out what's going on in my own town, mm. in my own community? It's, it's interesting in uh, Ezekiel, um, God talks about how terrible Sodom and Gomorrah was and it wasn't about their sexual sin. It actually talks about how they treated the poor. Wow. The evilness of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't the sexual sin according to Ezekiel. It was how they treated the poor, which is a really interesting way of thinking it, about that. And so I think for people to go, ah, God, what do you want to do in me that 
might provoke more, more anxiety in me. Even if it provokes more anxiety, I want to step into it. It's like being willing to step outside yeah. of our comfort zone and say, yeah. Lord, even though I don't know exactly what this looks like or exactly what you mm -hmm. need me to do, I'm willing. And then asking the Lord for guidance. It's yeah. like you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's almost like, God, I want to I wanna be used by you in ways I'm already comfortable with. And I don't see that in the Bible at all. True. At all, I don't see it. So it's this willingness to go, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know where to start, but help me take the next small step of what nonprofits are in my area? What's our police doing in our area? What's happening internationally? I've ju I would say being, one of my favorite phrases is being spiritually curious. Mm. Like, oh, what are you up to? What are you doing in our town? What are you doing in our community, in our church with vulnerable people? And just being curious uh, is a great starting place because um, people think they have to be experts to help, and that's just not true. That is so accurate that you don't have to be an expert. And Absolutely. I think it's good for people to say, okay, you don't even have to go right after you listen to this podcast or hear about it and get involved in a coalition or something along those lines, mm -hmm. but just posturing your heart to say, mm -hmm. Lord, I'm open to see how maybe I could get involved. That's a great starting point. Right. So even like someone listening to this podcast, let's say you have a, a 50 year old person in the United States listening to this podcast. They're like, I'm going to pass this podcast on to my young adult child and say, Hey, can you listen? This is interesting. I think we need to be thinking more about this. That's the first step. Like that's not this huge step in my counseling world. I always say, if the step is too big, break it down in half. And it's still too big, break it down in half. Just figure out one small, small, small next step. Um, cause if everybody's a small step, it's amazing what happens. So true. A bunch of small pebbles can cause a large. Oh, one. absolutely. And most great ideas started with the first small step. So true. I mean, just think what Zoe's doing now compared to when it was first started. True. It was small steps started and then one thing leads to another. And, and the other thing I would say there's a prayer is God, what do you want me to do that I normally would avoid? It's a hard prayer though. It is a hard prayer. But even just knowing that's an option, something yeah. really good to consider. Yeah. Okay, we kind of touched on this, but I'd love to know how can churches play a role in preventing human trafficking? Mm. That's something I think we should really unpack. Absolutely. I would say one of the best ways churches could do this is to promote caring for foster kids mm. and stepping into those places. Um. You know, I know in LA County, depending on who you ask, it's, I don't know, six, 70% ish of those who are trafficked have some foster care background. Uh, I think when churches step into foster care and provide safe, loving homes, that's a, a great uh, place to start. And I think some churches have seen caring for the vulnerable as an optional ministry. It's like giving blood. I'm all for giving blood, by the way, if those who are hearing me. <laughs> but uh, I think this idea of caring for the vulnerable can't be optional, it has to be essential. Yeah. And it can look different for different churches. What I've seen sometimes in church world is that it's a lot easier to give a small donation for something, and I'm all for small donations. You know, they'll do a backpack at the start of a school year, and that's great. I'm not against those things, or we'll collect socks for the shelter and all those are great things. It's a lot harder to go. I'm going to step into the foster care system and allow a child into my home. Yeah. And so I think the more churches can step into those, those places, cause it's complicated, it's messy mm -hmm. and go, all right, God, I'm willing to step into this. And the, the, the solution for the child welfare system is not more government policies. It's the church and family stepping and say, we'll love on that kid when it's complicated. I would say that's one of the, that would be so amazing if more churches did that out of, out of prevention. Yeah. And being, being, being a light and providing the, those stable homes. Another thing I think churches can do is talk about how 
there can be healing from trauma in healthy ways mm. uh, in some really healthy ways so uh, some churches i would say avoid trauma because you're like a new creature in christ kind of leaves almost language and it's a way to avoid the impact of trauma mm -hmm. so i'm part of a nonprofit called saga it's a JA in town it's a newer nonprofit. I, myself and a couple others help start and we bridge the gap between the mental health world and the church world yes and uh, kids need um, help sometimes with trauma they they go through um, another thing churches can really do is talk about child abuse yeah and especially sexual abuse um, when a kid has sexual abuse in their story they're so much more vulnerable to trafficking and it's amazing when I think churches don't talk about a topic, it gives it more power. Mm -hmm. There's just a level of secrecy oh, yeah. or a lack of understanding that's yep. present. Absolutely. Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine years ago, and he used to run like 12 step alcohol and not anonymous groups. Mm -hmm. And this is not scientific, but this is just his opinion. He said, I think. 60 to 70 percent of the men in those 12-step groups have sexual abuse as part of their story mm. and i know it obviously happens with men it's even higher with with women and when that gets addressed and that healing can happen that's amazing because it's it's awful but traffickers can pick up on youth who have past sexual trauma yes they know the they signs can, they pick up the signs and they can tell those kids who don't have a voice. And so one of the ways I think to love a kid sometimes is not just love the spiritual part of their life, but their whole being. Their whole being. Their whole being. And trauma affects the whole being. So just to reiterate, it's really this mindset of the church can get directly involved mm -hmm. by fostering youth, mm -hmm. creating stable home environments, mm -hmm. talking about trauma, and also speaking about the reality of abuse, specifically sexual abuse, mm -hmm. and not just focusing on women, but also creating opportunity for men Absolutely. to open up about those things. Yeah. Now, what does that look like in a in a in your mind? Is that something that happens directly from the pulpit? Do you think Absolutely. we need to have small groups? All, all the above. I had a, a friend of mine one time who was a, a therapist, Christian therapist, and she eventually wanted to specialize and healthy sexuality with Christian couples. Mm. So all she did at the end of her very first session is she changed one tiny part of her, her, her language. She said, you know, we can only cover so much in the first session. So next week, as you as a couple come back, if there's anything we didn't get to in regarding whatever in your marriage or your sexuality, she threw that one little phrase at the end. Let's talk about it next week. And guess what 50% of the couples now want to talk about at the very next their, their session part. of sexuality. Yeah. So because the therapist came across as I'm comfortable with it, the clients now realize it's okay to talk about it. Yeah. And I think pastors can do the same thing to go, we realize this happens. There's trauma or there's sexual abuse um, or there's domestic violence or whatever the area is. And we want to help you. Mm -hmm. and we want to address it. Um, our church at Valencia Hills, we have a group right now for women with past domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really tragic that a lot of women will say, I don't feel safe in the church setting um, because it doesn't get addressed. It means I'm all alone in my pain. And I know that's not what pastors mean. I know they have good intentions and there's so much on their plate. But if it doesn't ever get stated, people feel like I'm the only one. Right. And so the more it can be in a pulpit setting and in small groups, support groups. Our church has like a, we call it spiritual care, like a light counseling. Mm. The more avenues to say your pain matters and we want to actually talk about it, um, the better. Because I think the gospel doesn't just change our spiritual condition, but the way we view pain. Yes. It's like rejoicing in our suffering and mm -hmm. that concept of not that God wants us in pain, right. recognizing that how we respond to pain can make a huge difference in how we navigate life. Yeah. And even in Psalm 56, it says that 
he collects our tears in a bottle. He's mm-hmm. never apathetic or dismisses the pain. He like experience it with us. Yeah. Ultimately, it sounds like what you're saying boils down to the heart of God and that he mm-hmm. cares for us. He sees our pain, mm-hmm. cares for our affliction. He loves us through it and wants to help us in that healing process. And basically as a church, coming alongside people in that mm-hmm. healing process in whatever way makes sense to an individual, mm-hmm. right? Because of course we're in no way wanting to make people feel like they're falling short or they're not doing right. enough, right. but it's just more what can we do as the body of Christ? And yeah. really it seems like just having a willingness to recognize pain and not just recognize it, but come along some side someone in it. So one of the prayers I'd recommend for anybody who's part of any church, whether you're in leadership or just an attender, whatever your role is to say, God, I pray that more of the pain in this church would come to the surface for healing. For healing. Not for gossip, not to be known, just to be known, but for healing. Because uh, I would say relational wounds require relational healing. That's really true. Relational wounds require relational healing. Now, yeah. in work with trauma survivors, mm-hmm. a lot of them, they might not come from a faith background. Absolutely. In your experience um, as a licensed clinician, Mm -hmm. working, partnering with DCFS and dealing with foster youth, because as we know, they're particularly Mm -hmm. vulnerable. What is the the point you found with meeting youth who aren't coming from a place of faith, Mm -hmm. honoring them, but also showing the love of God? What does that look like? That's that's a great, great question. I would say that we, the church or Christians, offer belonging before they believe. I think in the old generations ago, it was you believe first and then you get belonging in a church setting. Yeah. I know in our church, we're having a number of people, they come to our church through our care department first and then end up in our church. Mm -hmm. And so I've said to many, many people in my office, your pain really matters. Um, And that has nothing to do if you come to the church or not. So I think people feel like the church is like a gym membership. If I agree and agree with what the pastor says or the leadership says, then I get the benefits, right. pay my dues. Right. And I would say, I hope more and more churches are like, we care about your pain and we want to actually step into your pain and help you not be alone in your pain. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to be like this conditional clause if you like, become a member here or join our church or give us money or any of those things that people feel like there's strings attached to their healing. Absolutely. Because the strings attached piece, if you really think about a survivor mm-hmm. who's unfortunately been exploited, mm-hmm. who's had some money that's always had strings attached, mm-hmm. we have to be very careful with mm-hmm. the way we approach faith and our love for the Lord yeah. as we meet survivors. Because unfortunately, I've heard several survivors who have had a lot of difficulty seeing how God can love them mm-hmm. when they've been through so much pain. Yeah. And that's very fair. That's a, an yeah. incredibly fair perspective. So I think yeah. we have to be sensitive to that as well yeah. when we're dealing with survivors. And I think one of the best things Christians can do is be so slow to take stuff personal. So good. I personally think if someone is mature in their faith, I think Christians should be the slowest people on the planet to take things really personal because we already have an identity given to us. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you have someone with a lot of trauma who connects with someone at church and with someone has trauma, they're going to have ups and downs relationally, how they connect, how they pull away. They're going to disappear maybe for weeks on end. They're not going to be as consistent sometimes. And then the person at the church takes it real personal or is judgmental say, oh, they're not really believing or what kind of flaky person is this? And then they get judgmental and the person's like, see, that didn't work. Mm. Um, don't realizing it's not even personal it's often about their trauma and they don't even know how they're coming across they're just trying to survive emotionally Yeah. and I think when someone's in a little bit of a chaos it's actually a chance to be more at the hands and feet of Jesus mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to take it personal I'm here to love you when it fits and it's, all right. it's a healthy situation and I just care about you whether you pull away from me or not yeah just creating a safe environment mm-hmm. for safe. anyone to come into. Specifically, Absolutely. we're talking about human trafficking, ending that. Mm-hmm. But as we've mentioned, a lot of the youth who do become exploited, unfortunately, mm-hmm. have experienced trauma. Mm-hmm. So really in the church setting, 
What are some, if you could just list maybe three to five signs mm -hmm. of a youth being vulnerable mm -hmm. and even share maybe experiences you've had as a pastor where you've been able to recognize mm -hmm. that a youth or an individual needed some, some specific care. One of the biggest vulnerabilities, and I see this a lot with females, is they feel really guilty if they disappoint anybody. They almost have this like weird belief that if people are happy with me, it equals I'm doing the right thing. And if they're disappointed with me, I'm doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like setting yourself up. Um, and I always say, one of my favorite prayers is God help me disappoint people the way you want me to. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a great disappointer. Um, meaning he disappointed people's expectations. So I think this can be for males and females, but a lot of females in church settings are like, if you're really a good, sweet Christian person, you won't disappoint people's expectations and not have boundaries. Interesting. One other like family mindset is don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. So silence. Yeah, silence about reality. Um, one of the best things parents can do sometimes is talk about what's happening in the moment. Interesting. When a parent, let's say gets a couple gets in a fight and the child sees it, and then later the mom says to the kid, we weren't really fighting, you know, that's just what happened. That actually fuels more anxiety in that child because the reality doesn't match the words. So one of the best things parents can do is like, let's talk about what just happened and put words to it. Um, another vulnerability is when the parents don't notice the internal world of the child, like how they're really doing. Another one would be not um, having any conversations training education about the child and social media mm. um, and I have not addressing that at all just oh that's just what you know you do or teenagers do and then uh, family secrets that don't get addressed I'm actually teaching a class at our church right now on the power of secrets and family secrets how they affect us um, they affect us more than we realize sometimes so I would say all, all those are huge indicators that there's some vulnerability going on that's good because I think sometimes we'll say things, just vulnerability, but mm -hmm. it's good to have some things to look out for. So if we are, whether it's in church or in our daily mm -hmm. lives, and we're seeing youth mm -hmm. or people who are displaying some of those signs, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they feel a lot of shame maybe when they disappoint mm -hmm. someone, they aren't very open with their communication or feel like they're disconnected from reality, whatever those things are, that that's a sign that maybe we can love on them a bit more and come yeah, alongside them. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. And I really think boundaries is not just a psychological thing, it's really a biblical thing. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart. I was just talking to a ministry partner or a leader today that sometimes people take boundaries as rejection. And I'm like, no, boundaries isn't equal rejection, but I think in Christian lives or churches, we feel that sometimes. Maybe just in general too, yeah. not just Christian circles. I think yeah. if we haven't had boundaries respected, yeah. then it can cause a lot of different reactions when people don't, you know, accept boundaries. Right. And to really say your voice matters. Yeah. Um, so I've seen like situations where let's say there's a 12 year old girl who goes to a family function and there's the creepy uncle there at the Christmas holiday and the parents say, you better give them a hug no matter what. I know they're not intending this, but what they're saying is your voice doesn't matter. The need to not be embarrassed trumps your voice. And I know those are really subtle and that doesn't mean they're terrible parents all the time. Um, but I think that how that gets felt and experienced has a lot of impact. So what would you say are some common misconceptions that Christians may have about human trafficking and about survivors specifically? So the first one, I think most people think of trafficking is, I think that people, especially my age, or a lot of people have this creepy white van that kidnaps the kid and offers them a gift or candy or whatever the thing is. And, they, and there's very little knowledge, I think, in the general public about both in-person and online grooming. There's very little knowledge that the, how that goes about. It's they think of the typical kidnapping or the movie Taken or all those type of things. So that's definitely one of the 
the biggest misconceptions, and really that, that doesn't even happen in the United States. Right. That this is something in other foreign countries, or some people think that's only like in the really difficult parts of like inner city life. What happens is I think trafficking in a lot of communities is like unknown cancer in someone's body. Until it's detected, it'll continue to grow and cause great harm. I just think this is where everybody needs to have a voice. This isn't something just for nonprofits or the law enforcement. This is for every sector needs to know something about, about this um, because it affects schools, it affects our medical communities, it affects our families, our relatives, our neighbors, it affects everything. Right. So with this misconception, if the idea, the false idea, is that it's always the guy in the creepy vans yeah. handing out candy and kidnapping yeah. people, if that's not what human trafficking yeah. is, what is human trafficking then? What does it look like in a daily? Yeah, it, to me, it's the the, the grooming. To, and it often can come across as someone coming across as a, a guy who's like, I'm really interested, almost in a dating relationship. And the tragic part is often the victim doesn't even know they're a victim because of the grooming process. And so what happens is that the victim will go back home after an incident or situation or go back to the school and not self-identify as a victim. So if after this podcast, if I went out to the parking lot and my car was stolen, I would say I'm a victim of theft. It'd be really obvious. I'd self-identify. I would call the police versus a lot of the individuals, especially you know, women are, are groomed and they just think my my boyfriend's really into some weird sex or is electric controlling and wants me to do some weird stuff, but they're afraid of being alone and all those type of things, which really um, make it so much more difficult to find or assess. The other thing that's a misconception that's connected is a majority of sexual abuse in our country is by people that already know the child, not by a stranger. Like I talk to churches all the time and they're like, we need to have better like doors and security from strangers entering our church and kidnapping and abusing a child. And I'm all for that. That's a good thing. I recommend that. But a high percentage of like sexual abuse within families, schools, churches are from people that already have some relationship with the child. I know that freaks people out and that's really so disconcerting. But both trafficking and just sexual abuse in general often start the people that slowly build a relationship. Yes. And I love that you touched on grooming because mm -hmm. there's sexual abuse, then there's human trafficking, and there is sometimes a gray area where people have some difficulty determining what's what. But the common denominator between both of them mm -hmm. is grooming and that there's somebody who had the intention to manipulate and abuse you mm -hmm. and they purposely established a relationship. Many times grooming might include isolating a person Absolutely. from family, shaming them into thinking that if people found out, it could destroy the family mm -hmm. unit. Or even, I imagine, within the church, let's say that there's a youth who doesn't fit the typical profile mm -hmm. of maybe they're not a foster mm -hmm. youth. Maybe they are a child in a church-going family, everything seemingly great. We have stories even here in Santa Clarita mm -hmm. of several youth who've become victims of exploitation. There's a sense of shame, I'm sure they experience, Absolutely. right? What What would you say to that? There's a sense that the um, the perpetrator or the one who's doing the grooming will often find a, a kid that either won't have a voice or a voice that won't be believed. They actually will pick a youth that has either one of those. Doesn't have much of a voice or a voice that won't be believed. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really tragic because then that person's really alone. And I think shame, it like strangles someone's voice. That's what shame does. It strangles a voice. And so they often think, what's wrong with me? Or I brought this on. I should have noticed what's wrong with how I think about things. And then I can't trust my own instincts. And so it even more deteriorates their voice. Yeah. I think shame is so detrimental. One of the things that can be challenging for people is how do we also have empathy for our traffickers? You know, what yeah, does that look like? That's, that's a great question. I really think that no one should ever have to earn my compassion. I think that's a starting place. I think that's what God does for us. So I would say a high percentage of traffickers experience a lot of violence in their home growing up. There's a research a lot about domestic violence. 
and the role of power and violence um, in their own home prior to them becoming someone that traffics her rooms. Yeah. So I've, I've seen that over and over. That's definitely a trend. And so I think we sometimes um, confuse or we think all or nothing in this arena. Like what they did is awful, but I can still have compassion at the same time. We either, either go either or like, it's just awful and just throw the key away, put them in jail or compassion. And then people are like, how dare you, you know, not have justice for them. And I really think that we need both. Like, yes, there's consequences, but at the same time, um, of compassion for the story that led them to do what they do. Right. And that's that's a piece that can be so challenging. Mm -hmm. Even for myself, it can be very challenging because I have seen firsthand by working with survivors mm -hmm. the trauma that they've endured at the hands of somebody mm -hmm. else. And it can naturally bring up emotions where we might have frustration or whatever the feelings are towards those individuals. But I think that as a church, since we're talking from that perspective, it's always taking that step back and remembering what God has done for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it circles back to what you were saying in the beginning, what's right. God's heart towards us. Yeah, I think when, when I was in my social work kind of field, one of the most difficult, like, beliefs I've wrestled, had to wrestle with, because I would take kids away from parents when there was abuse. And to be the one to interview the kids and go to the stand at times. One of the, the, these these beliefs that was just like, if it wasn't for the grace of God, part of me could be doing the same thing the perpetrator did. That's a big statement. Let's elaborate on that. So, like, because if I grew up in that same environment that that perpetrator was in, had the same family system, maybe the same addiction going on in that family system, I might have some of the same capacities. I had to wrestle, and that's a humbling, like, because part of me wants to go, oh, I would never. I'm not like one of those type of people, but some of the stories that these perpetrators come from is, is pretty, pretty, pretty tough. And again, never to minimize what they're doing, but to go, I also have capacity to cause great harm with people in my life. It might look differently, but my capacity to cause harm is about a step or two away. And we all have that for really honest before each other and before God. Yeah. And I think that's the piece. When, it, when we talk about compassion, mm -hmm. it's not to say that we should just condone or accept or Absolutely. passive in Absolutely. fighting for justice, but to realize that if we were given a handful of different circumstances, mm -hmm. we can't confidently say that we would never do what somebody else has done. Oh, yeah. I mean, some of the stories of the individuals who are perpetrators of torture, of being introduced to drugs at three years old, to you know, being rewarded to watch pornography at five years old. I mean, listen, I'm not saying every per perpetrator has those things, but I've heard, I know those stories and I've talked to people about those stories. Yeah. And it's just, it's a tough balance of, yeah, I think you should just go to jail. I'm going to call the police on you if I know about stuff, but I have compassion for you in the process to yeah. both ends. And it seems like really it circles back to what we talked about at the top of this of the church getting involved in creating stability mm -hmm. in having godly um, relationships with people, mm -hmm. whether that's fostering youth, mm -hmm. whether in their own family, they're working to create a healthy family structure mm -hmm. because we can look, I'm sure, at several victims, several traffickers, several people in general who become victims or are in crime that came from unstable backgrounds wow. that didn't have the love of God. Absolutely. You know, were victims of abuse themselves. Yeah, one of the things we're working on in our church with some of the people that are part of our care ministry is having this mindset of looking at how did my story impact me currently through God's eyes. Like, how we be honest about not just what happened, but the impact yeah. of what happened. That's, to me, one of the signs of healing from difficult stories is I see the impact. So how did that sto part of my story impact, impact my spiritual life, my emotional life, my view of marriage, my view of parenting? If I can't articulate the impact, I still have a lot of work to do. Amen. And we all have work to do. Right. You know, it's like kind of one of the beautiful things in our humanity is we Absolutely. all will suffer, but we all also have the opportunity to experience the love of God, Absolutely. the redeeming power of God, to be healed and renewed and 
like you said, to meet people in their pain. Mm -hmm. Because somebody met us in ours, and that person is Jesus. Absolutely. But there's also other people that we've been blessed that have come alongside us in our lives to help us get to where we are. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's like stewardship of the gifts we've been given. Yep. I don't want just to take, God's love towards me is not just for me. Like if I don't pass it on to people, um, I'm actually, I would say, minimizing the intent of God's love. That's so powerful. God's love is not just meant for us. Absolutely. That's really what it boils down to. I think a lot of our conversation today, everything can really come back down to that point of it's not all about what God's doing for us, but also what God wants to do through us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I was, my one of my constant prayers is God help me see um, the pain right around me um, and that be too busy to no- not notice. Let me see what's going on. Okay, so we've covered so many different things and all of them really boil down to us being willing as a church mm-hmm. to show up for people, to share the love of God and allow mm-hmm. the Lord to show us what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Now, what would you say are some things that we can do to ensure that our efforts are sustainable, right? Because mm-hmm. sometimes we might get excited say, this is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And then we realize, wait, am I in this for the long haul? Mm-hmm. Or is this just a one-time donation? What would you say? How can we be sustainable in our efforts? There's a mindset of, I want this to be not just something I did once, but who I become. Like all of us need to have a greater heart and capacity for vulnerable people. I think that's been one of the challenges lately with all the COVID stuff the last three years is when I'm living at a peak level of anxiety, I have less creativity to address someone else's pain. I would also say, God, help me use some of my story um, to help someone who else is going through similar pain. So th- I think it's, it's not just like, oh, I gave one time so I feel better. And there's nothing wrong with starting there. But I would say I want this to be something that I get to model for my kids or this becomes of our like church culture or this is some way I want to influence my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to be a voice for, for, for the voiceless. Because I've always, here's, here's been one of my personal thoughts. If like something awful were to happen like to my wife and I and my kids got like involved in really something awful, I have two teenage boys. I would want people to go out of their way across the country to love my boys. That's what I want. I want people to literally do sacrificial things. And all of these kids is someone's kid. All of these kids, someone's kid. And uh, so that's how we have to see. These are somebody's kids. These aren't stats. These aren't just a good marketing program for Zoe. These are somebody's kids. Somebody's babies. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And being willing to stand up, step in to protect. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sometimes in a counseling session, I'll say, I wonder um, what words you wish you could have said when you were five or six, but you didn't have the words yet that would have helped you out of the voice. Yeah. I wonder what was like mulling inside of you that you didn't have the words yet for. Mm -hmm. Because every five-year-old feels it, but he's not the words for it. And so to give these kids a voice um, is really something that's, again, I can't, it can't be optional. Like it's a conviction. This can be optional to give kids a voice. Yeah. Like you've said, meeting somebody in their vulnerability is not optional. It is aligned with the heart of God. And if we're going to show up as a church, we need to be willing to come alongside people. And one other thing I would say is you don't have to like travel the world to go help in this. One of the best things you can do is befriend um, kids you already know. So if there's a neighbor next door, show interest in their sport. If there's, you know, in your church group, have the kids over to your house. Like every family, um, would, if they're a healthy family, wants other mature adults to love on their kids. Every family would want that. And I've even seen in my own personal life, the, the youth that do the best have people that love on them besides their parents, not just their parents. Yeah. They have one or two other adults that they're like, they get me. Just to notice them and go, oh, how you doing? What's really going on? Mm-hmm. Um, everybody can do that as a starting place. 
I love that. I, I think that we've had an amazing conversation today. And Thank you. one of the biggest takeaways I'm going to have is that showing up for survivors is not just something you do. You have to be willing to become somebody who does that. And I just want to say, and nobody told me to say this, <laughs> I love what Zoe does. I hope people support Zoe with prayer, finances, time, because I think you guys are doing amazing work and you're a trusted group of people that loves on kids. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate you being here, Pastor Dan. Thank you. Amazing. You shared so much. And thank you to all of you who listened today. If you would like more information, you can visit gozoe.org. And if you want to email us, you have any questions or even some topics you'd like us to cover, you can send us an email at podcasts at gozoe.org. We appreciate all of you and we thank you for listening. And we know that God will continue to move through you and use you. And we just have to remember that we always have to be willing. So thank you again for tuning in to the Light in the Darkness podcast. Until next time, keep shining.